Good afternoon, everyone, and I'm delighted to welcome A.S. Byatt, Adam Fools, who's just about to sit down, and Laura Barber in the middle to Small Wonder to discuss the art and craft of translation and what may be lost and what might be gained in the process. The focus of the event is an intriguing anthology published by Granta, Multiples, which contains 12 stories rendered into 18 languages by 61 international authors. The result isn't chaos, as you might imagine. It's um, intriguing, and it's been compared to a game of literary consequences or Chinese whispers. Um, it's very playful and poses many interesting questions. A.S. Spiat and Adam Fools were two of the ace players in that game of literary consequences or Chinese whispers, or it could be called a short story relay race. And Laura Barber, who will chair the event, commissioned the anthology. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Laura and her track record, um, and then she will introduce A.S. Spiat and Adam. Um, Laura is a publisher with a particular interest in translation. She used to run the Penguin Classics List, where she worked on new translations of Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Chekhov and Balzac. And she's now the editorial director of Granta and Portobello Books, where she acquires work in translation for both imprints. This year, she's published the Swiss-German writer Peter Stamm, who was nominated for the Man Booker International Prize, and the Japanese author Hiromo Kowakami. She put that there specially to test my ability, <laughs> even in English, to pronounce his name, um, who was shortlisted for the Man Asian Prize. And so I, I, I'll... Laura will guide us through this session, um, but just before I hand over to her, there are two things I'd like to say. One is, um, you might hear some noises off. Um, this is a traditional Sussex barn. Cows are being milked there, and you might hear the sound noises off even a milking machine. Try not to let it um, distract you. And finally, um, I'd like to express my thanks to the University of Chichester for sponsoring this event. So I now hand over to Laura. Thank you, Diana. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here at Charleston um, this afternoon and a real honour to be sharing the stage with two such acclaimed writers. Over the next hour, we're going to be talking about translation and the way that um, what change happens in a story and to an author's style as it changes um, passed from language to language. There will be time for you to um, ask your own questions at the end of the event. But first, before we begin, um, two introductions. Firstly, to Dame Antonia Byatt. A.S. Byatt is the author of 22 books, including 16 volumes of fiction and six works of criticism. She's worked, featured on more British and international literary prize lists than I can count, and won many of them, most famously winning the Booker Prize for Possession and most recently winning the James Tate Black for the children's book. Her work has been filmed twice and translated into 31 languages. She herself speaks not very many less than that, fewer than that. She is completely fluent in two languages, speaks two more with ease, taught herself a further three languages well enough to be able to read them, and has some basic Japanese. I think that's gone. I, I did have. <laughs> I got lost in a taxi and I was able to say, no, no, please turn left, not right. <laughs> well, I could probably order some sushi and say Ichiban, which is number one. But, um, <laughs> um, Adam Foles is the author of two novels and one novella in verse. He's also been nominated for, or won, almost every literary prize going, including the Betty Trask, the European Union Prize for Literature, the Encore Award, and the Costa Book Award for Poetry. And earlier this year, he was named as one of Granter's best young novelists. His work has been translated into 11 languages, and he speaks three with, he tells me, mixed results. Yeah, I will make an attempt. Um, <laughs> and I have learnt some of them for some, for varying periods, but I'm essentially uh, a monoglot who overestimates his capacity to uh, communicate in other languages. <laughs> um, at this point, I'm going to pass over my own linguistic um, proficiency quite quickly um, and make the, the final introduction to, to the book, which Diana has already um, explained a little, which is a game of, of Chinese, um, uh, literary, literary Chinese whispers. 
um, in which each story is translated from a foreign language into English and then into another language. And at each point, the, the person who's translating only gets to see the one before. So as you can imagine, the results are, are surprising. But also ask some quite serious questions about um, how much style is to do with the, with the words one chooses and, and what, what can be lost or, or indeed found in passing it from hand to hand. Um, and the complicating factor in this literary experiment was that not all of the, um, the, tra- the people who were involved were actually professional translators. Indeed, most of them were undertaking a translation for the first time in their literary careers. And one of them um, didn't speak really very much of the language at all, so relied rather heavily on Google Translate and his own slightly <laughs> wayward <laughs> imagination. Um, but that's, that's the theory, and I thought that um, to start off, we should see some of this in practice. And um, Antonia and Adam both translated from the same story, which was Richard Middleton's The Making of a Man. Um, and Antonia, you were f- uh, earlier along in the process. Do you want to explain at what point you came in? Um, well, the story by Richard Middleton was translated by Javier Marias because he wanted to translate it into Spanish. It was then retranslated into English and it was done by Julia Frank from that English into German. And I translated that German into English and then it went into Hebrew, did it? It did, yes. Orly uh, Castle Bloom, Israeli novelist, translated it into Hebrew. Um, and then uh, I, together with uh, an, uh, an Israeli woman, a native Hebrew speaker who uh, helped me with a kind of rough literal translation, uh, brought it back into English for its uh, final appearance. Would you like to read a bit from, from the beginning? From the beginning. I can't read the bloody bit. Um, <laughs> perhaps not. Um, it gets very bloody, this story. Um, there he was an unremarkable little clerk in the middle of the night, haplessly trying to find Vauxhall Station, lost in a labyrinth of mean and twisting streets. He was increasingly afraid that he had missed the last train, but even the thought of asking anyone for directions froze his nerves. Any passerby could turn out to be a thief. And as the state of his nerves deteriorated, he noticed how the rain was soaking the cloth of his coat, saturating it, ruining it. That really upset him. He worked in the drapery department, and he took great care to be smartly dressed. Why on earth had he not gone to Waterloo, as Murray had told him to? Why on earth hadn't he brought an umbrella? And why, why on earth were there no policemen anywhere? But as he hurried on, things changed. The houses became steadily more elegant, larger and smarter, and the unremarkable little clerk calmed himself with the hope that surely, sure, maybe at the next corner, he would now find his way. Suddenly, he saw a small light burning. It was in a window on the first floor of one of those houses. No sooner had he turned towards it than the front door opened. A woman appeared, framed in the opening, and looked intently at him. What luck, what a relief for Simmons to have come across a woman. He wasn't afraid of women, although he was very young. (laughs) Thank you. Um, The title of this was the first thing I noticed that had had changed. Um, The making of a man went into Spanish to uh, como se hace en hombre, and then How to Become a Man in Andrew Sean Greer's, and then Man Verden in um, Julia Frank's, and yours is Manhood. Can you explain why? I couldn't, get an, I couldn't get an English that sounded nice about becoming a man. I thought it didn't sound very nice. What was it that he originally called it? Um, the Making of a Man. The Making of a Man. That would have been good, but it wouldn't have translated Julia Frank, because she, it, hers is to become a man, becoming a man. And is that, is that a particular, um, it's, a, it's a kind of a rite of passage that is a known, a known thing, because becoming, the making of a man isn't something that would, one would say. It's no, a, I, um, it gets sort of, it gets, 
it goes in and out, really, of being sexual, the idea of becoming a man. And the bit I've just read out, I think, shows that in the original story, it was just that he was very young. He was sort of, he didn't know what he was doing. But it becomes more and more sexual as the story goes on. Julia Frank's German is very taut and tense and to the point. I think her version is more to the point than the original version in a curious way. It's sort of quite hard, mm. which I enjoyed translating, but it leaves you not very much room to do anything other than try and do what she's doing. Yeah. You said your approach to, um, to this was very literal. You weren't trying to subtract anything or add anything. No, I, I believe translation is a secondary art. It is an art. But I, I also, I'm a writer. I believe a writer owns his or her own text. And I used to have terrible arguments with my French translator, who had a deep, now dead, he had a deep desire to improve my texts. <laughs> um, and he once put in sort of two pages of an incredibly complicated joke, which was where I had put a joke, but this was a Roman Catholic joke, which I couldn't have done because I wouldn't have known, and I didn't want a Roman Catholic joke in the middle of my book. And he said, oh, yes, but it's such a... He was Jewish himself. He said, oh, yes, but it was a good joke. Um, <laughs> and the, uh, the other thing he used to do was the exact opposite. He would... He would ring me up or write me a letter, and he would say, of course, I can't make this sentence any better than it unfortunately is. <laughs> so, so getting on with him was sort of, was like climbing up and down hills, really. Um, but he did love the French language. I think that's the final thing in this comment. You need to love, as my best translators, my Italian translators, and my German translator, and the Danish one, they all say, you need to write your own language well. That's the most important thing. And yeah. I think that's true. And I, I, I have been very lucky with my translators. And was this the first time you'd tried to translate something? No, I once translated a French fairy story for a collection that Mary, Marina Warner edited. Okay. And it was either the green snake or the green serpent. And I remember spending a long time wondering whether to use the Latin or whether to use the English. And if in doubt, I tend to use Anglo-Saxon-derived words rather than Latin-derived words. Um, but I don't know if I... I can't remember now whether I left it as snake or... And we, when you were um, translating this, obviously you weren't able to see the um, original that Javier Marias had translated. But you were... Uh, I think at one point you, you talked about trying to understand, you sort of almost read through the German to imagine what it was that he had, he, he had translated. Um, yes. I... I, f I think it was a mistake for the original publishers not to send us the original, not to send us, the authors, the original, because we were all asked to write a comment on what we had done and why we had done it. But at no point did we ever see the original, and I got rather irate about this because I think the original is the single most important thing, and I sent them emails saying, I must have the original, or I won't write <laughs> you anything. And so then the original came through, and it was what I had suspected. It's, there's a kind of really professional 1920s sort of story that was in all those wonderful short story magazines that existed then and have one by one disappeared. I remember my parents used to take Argosy and I sat and read short stories in it. Um, and I was by and large right. Um, the German I had read was a translation of that particular kind of very professional Mm. storytelling at that period so I was trying to do mm. the same thing I, I was um, before this thinking should I try to track down the Richard Middleton because that doesn't actually appear in the book either we only get Javier Maris's version of it and then I wasn't sure whether he actually might have made it up because that would not be beyond um, the realms of possibility for Javier Maris to do I mean he's, he's, he's invented a lot of things including um, he's, he's sort of is he a king of the kingdom? Redonda. Yes. I am or was the only duchess. Oh! I, um, I think now <laughs> Alice Munro has become the other duchess. <laughs> there are one or two people I'm terrified are going to get elected at some point. But it sounds very Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> it's totally... It doesn't exist, but he keeps it electing people, and it, it gives a prize. It's a, it's a rocky mountain with nothing on it, and it had previous owners. So oh. I wasn't sure whether this was actually a, an elaborate literary joke where the, Richard Middleton had actually not existed, but then he does have a Wikipedia entry, which doesn't really get you very far. But No, Adam Thirlwell said that. I, I mean, 
I should simply be personally deeply disappointed if he didn't exist. I would find it less interesting. He is so typical of what I thought mm. it was that he was. But if, he, if he turned out to have been invented by Javier, I would be, I would be quite let down. Um, <laughs> I, I More impressed. <laughs> both, yes. But, but I, I do feel that, no, if, if it was all a game, it would be sort of both meaningless and beautiful. Um, Adam, do you want to... So, after um, Antonia's, it went through Hebrew. That's right. And then, do you want to yeah. uh, explain what you did with it? Uh, well, I, um, as you all hear, I took this translation quite far uh, in one possible direction, um, which is uh, a, a rewriting, essentially, or um, translation as reading, as interpretation. So it's a version um, this, I have to say, I was um, kind of pro uh, ushered towards this um, by Adam Thirlwell, the editor, who wanted to make, uh, make sure there were um, in the volume uh, examples of translation that were as kind of provocative as possible. So I offer this very much in the spirit of the game of translation and not necessarily uh, you know, as a kind of adumbration of my beliefs about what translation should be. Anyway, it was fun to do. Um, this is uh, Manhood Strophes. One, it is a question of the separation and joining of bodies, first one and then the other. Two, for example, after his fear of being lost, of poverty and lack of law, comes his anger. The rain is soaking his coat. The wet world penetrates the fine personal fabric. This, quotes, infuriated him. Three, he turns a corner. That's better. Money engorges property. Homes enlarge and separate. They are proud. There is space between them. That's much better. Four. In the darkness, a light coming on like a new thought, which is the body of a woman. The body of a woman in a doorway is a doorway. Five. For the achievement of manhood, words are not essential matter. They are link work, ligature and conveyance. Excuse me, madam, would you kindly tell me the way to Vauxhall Station? Are you a medical student? A medical student? No, I can see that you aren't. Is there anything that I can do for you? Yes, yes there is. I need help desperately. There, that's done. In through the door. Six. It's upstairs. It. It always is. Whatever the indefinite article is, it awaits you. Be a man. Take a knife and cut it to define, to give it an edge. 7. Meanwhile, her coverings are interesting. Bright, expensive rings, a faded, expensive dress. Linger in the chambers of the social while you can. Discriminate, be polite, while making those private financial calculations. 8. That end now. There. A body in the room. A man. The last one. Dead? Dead. 9. The gaslight hiss from overhead reminds the young man of the sea at Margate sliding over pebbles in its incessant dissolution, cresting and collapsing at his feet. The blankness of matter, the edge of unconsciousness, grey water, nothing. This is manhood's proper ground. He is in the right place. Right there. Thank you. Um, as you can see, quite a lot um, changed. And I just wondered <laughs> what what might have happened between um, Antonia's and yours. Could you t was the, what was the Hebrew like? Well, as I say, um, my Hebrew is pretty ropey. I learnt it um, twenty years ago uh, in a uh, in Israel in the kind of course that new immigrants do, so a six month language course. So I had kind of uh, that functional um, immigrant Hebrew. Um, and some uh, liturgical, biblical Hebrew that um, is kind of in, in, lodged in there um, from before. Um, but it's certainly not good enough to deal with this text on my own. So I um, sought a, a friend, a helping hand, um, which arrived in the form of uh, a woman called Meita Lamar. And we, I arranged to meet with her in a cafe. Um, and together we sat down with the text and... Um, she, we read it together essentially, and she, um, I offered my thoughts where I could, and the rest of the time she was just giving me a quick kind of off-the-cuff 
literal translation. Um, my, my idea for doing it this way was that I wanted it to be as loose as possible that I, so that I had as much kind of room for manoeuvre creatively. So I wanted just a kind of handwritten uh, notebook text um, that was very uh, unfixed. As it turned out, what I discovered from doing that was that was how robust uh, some uh, aspects of translation are. At least, you know, when I came to look at that text, and my first act was just to kind of was to tidy it and to oops to um, uh, to try and uh, make it stylistically coherent in a way that pleased me. So a fairly straight act of translation, and I delivered that to Adam Thorwell, the editor. He found that it was. Uh, remarkably close to uh, previous acts of translation and suggested I, uh, I do something a bit more wayward with it, um, which I was happy to do, um, partly because I, I wasn't kind of m m madly in love with the story. It's, um, it's, a, it's very uh, rich in a, in a particular way. It's full of this kind of psychosexual turbulence um, to sound kind of jargony, but it's, it, it, there's lots of stuff going on in it, um, it's a lot of which feels quite sort of inchoate. Um, uh, and I didn't, it didn't feel like a, f a, a fully achieved artistic work, at least as far as I could see it. Um, so that, in, that sort of, I felt, gave me more license or more will, actually, to shape it in, in some way that um, satisfied me. So what, you, what I ended up with is this text where I have, which is a very strong act of reading, so I've kind of pulled out my, its imagery and my understanding of it and patterned it in a way that um, satisfied me. Um, but is, uh, in a way, it's, it's, it's an act of analysis. Yeah. So, you know, all translation, all reading is translation. All reading is interpretation. All translation is reading. This is a kind of exacerbation of that thought that is intended to kind of lay it bare. It almost seemed to me, um, in, in the language you use, where you're really drawing out the, um, the sort of the, 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 um, the subtext, mm. that you're almost psychoanalyzing the text. Uh, yeah, th that's right. So. Um, yeah, it was about my uh, working out what this, uh, what this take on manhood was, mm. you know. Um, and in the Hebrew, it's, ma it's manhood, it's lost this sense of becoming. Um, which I th in a way I think I reintroduced with my uh, with my sort of subtitle which is strophes it's, the idea is that it's a prose poem and the strophe is, is something that crosses it's the line that uh, crosses uh, so the idea of crossing thresholds yeah. and uh, the act and becoming is I, I wanted to kind of refine and put, put back in the text and you also um, mentioned in your in your note on this that that the atmosphere of it had remind you, reminded you of the wasteland and early Eliot. And that, there's that, that, that you introduced this, the idea of, of Margate, which yeah. I don't think was in the earlier no. version. So we have, um, actually I can't, I can't quite remember what the reference is. I mean, we have this hissing gaslight and it sounds yeah. like it Sounds the like the waves. It sounds like waves. And I took, that, I took that into, that suggested to me, given that we're in kind of a murky London of this period, and we have this very uh, wound up kind of sexually... <laughs> Uh, uneasy, sexually nervous Clark character, um, and he, and, yeah, it it kind of uh, suggested to me the landscape of the wasteland and T. S. Eliot's, mm. uh, you know, the the sexual encounters in the wasteland, and also the stuff about Margate. It seemed like the right sort of place to, you know, as a resort near London, it would make sense for this character, um, and also, uh, yeah, it was it was, I, I guess, part of what I'm doing. Um, so the line in, you, you see, I'm, I'm sure you'll remember, in uh, The Wasteland is, on Margate Sands, I can connect nothing with nothing. Um, and so I'm, by introducing Margate, I'm introducing a literary illusion, and that is part, it's another aspect of the act of reading, mm -hmm. is, that what, is that constellating around what you read are the things that associate with it. So I'm kind of introducing that and... Uh, uh, and, and wanting to kind of expose that as part of the act of reading as yeah. well, that other texts get called in. Yeah. It also seemed to serve to, to me to make it more chilling when I mean, there's a bit where, um, I, I'm not giving too much away to say, there's some hacking up of a body that goes on um, as, as part of this man um, achieving um, manhood. And 
and it just sort of says, after he'd finished his work on the beach, as though he'd mentally transported himself somewhere else, which, which was, um, I thought, a really interesting introduction of, of something different. Um, Antonio, what did you make of Adam's protagonist? Because um, he, he seemed to me to have quite a different character from your... Well, I was worried yours. because I, I am a sort of proponent of accurate literal translation. Um, at the same time, I thought there was quite a lot in him, and he was he was more interesting. Mm. And but he ought to have got out of that story at that point and got into another story. Or <laughs> it's, um, I think it really is that I have a, an excessive respect for one word after the other once somebody has put them down, and I have a terrible sense of proprietoriness about my own work. So if anybody did that to my work. I would A, see that it was very clever and very interesting and B, be very cross. Mm. <laughs> I was going to ask about that, actually, because you, um, as a writer, um, you take such care over the choice of, of language and you've said, I've, I write novels because I'm passionately interested in language. And yet here, you were at the service of someone else's um, text and I wondered if there were ever any moments where you felt your own style sort of peeping in. No. I, I, I tried to see what his style was, and as Adam says, it's not that good. I mean, it's a, it's a workmanlike... I don't know when it was written, but it feels like the 1920s. Yeah. It, it's a workmanlike magazine story with slightly more blood and gore in it than you normally get. Um, now, I had read something by G.K. Chesterton that was remarkably similar about really? a dead body in a bedroom, yes. Yeah because I, I nicked that and put it in the children's <laughs> book. Right. Um, but I had a right to do that because that was my book. Yes. <laughs> uh, and it struck me as a sort of wonderful scene where you go upstairs mm. and find that the person is dead and chopped up to pieces. And this causes me to think that it was probably a recurring motif mm. um, in that period of people being chopped to bits in bedrooms. Mm. Um, <laughs> and once you have that thought, then you can do something like what you did, or you can do almost anything, really, because you've taken possession of the central image. Yeah. Um, but I think I would be quite... Well, I used to be annoyed with my French translator for putting things mm. in. Because um, I think, as, a, as an editor, I'm probably coming to this from a slightly different perspective um, from both of you, and I, I've been thinking about this quite a lot in the last few weeks because we've just commissioned a translation um, of an Italian novel which, um, when it came in, I had to edit the translation. But I also then found myself editing the novel as well, which I, when I ran the classics list, of course, I couldn't do because most of the authors were, were dead, so I couldn't um, have that kind of um, toing and froing with them. Um, and also, I think you treat a, a text differently when you know the author um, is dead, and also when they are Chekhov, you don't really have very much to, to argue with them about anyway. Um, but in this translation... The plot didn't make sense in some points at all. And we also made a big... In order to kind of get over that, in the end, we ended up changing the gender of the Ooh. central character, Death. Um, because I think in the Italian, um, Death is, is a personified la morte. So yes, it has to be female. But in English, of course, I think most people would think of Death if, if they think of it, assigning him a gender him a gender at all. They would, they would assign yeah. him a male gender. Um, so that was just something which... Um, and I kind of justified that by thinking that if this novel had come into me in English, I wouldn't feel any qualms at all about editing it in the way that I would an English text. But I was interested in, in your notes when you talked about American line editors. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> as well. <laughs> um, they, they, uh, you shouldn't have let me start on this. Um, <laughs> you really shouldn't. Um, they believe they are doing creative artwork of their own. And particularly on The New Yorker, if you send in a story, they believe it is their moral duty to change something in every line. Um, I write very carefully. I may not write perfectly. I write as well as I can. And I do not want them coming along and um, simply changing the words in order to have been creative. And there's a point when I put a series of adjectives in the wrong order, so that the one that came at the end was a great shock because you wouldn't have expected it. They just moved them all around again and made it banal. And it really... Um, shall I tell you the story of my father's funeral very quickly? Yes, please. Um, I wrote a short story 
about the death of well, about my father called Sugar. It's one of the only autobiographical things I've ever re read. And the story ends with the funeral of this Quaker person and a Quaker meeting in a crematorium. And the New Yorker rang me up and said, we've been in touch with the Quakers in Philadelphia, and they say this couldn't have happened. So I said, well, I actually commissioned this funeral, and I was present at it. So there was big silence on the other end of the phone. Well, how shall we change it then? <laughs> <laughs> it, it really is sort of... And another one, another New Yorker editor, who was trying to change a lot of... The, uh, it was a review I'd written of the... Um, autobiography of Doris Lessing and she said look it's, my job's not worth it if I don't change something in every line but they do have a specific style don't they I mean I think, I think that's an example of, of imposing a certain sort of house style which is more marked than, than other places I think it is but they have you by the neck because they're the only people who pay at all decently for a short story <laughs> and so there are little groups of writers all over the world commiserating with each other over <laughs> what the New Yorker has done to them <laughs> I won't get you started on my punctuation. Um, Adam, um, I'm guessing, you mean, obviously you took liberties and were encouraged to take liberties with, with this text. But I imagine that if someone had done the same to one of your um, translations, you would, one of your novels in translation, you wouldn't be best pleased. D depending on what it was claiming it was. You know, if it, um, if it, if it were a, a brazenly, openly a new work that is a variation... Um, or you know, out of my work, that would be something I'd be interested in uh, seeing, um, or you know, happy to entertain the thought of, but not if it were pretending to be you know uh, a straight translation. And I was, I was interested as well in, in um, obviously one of your um, very successful books is the prose novella, a uh, poetry novella. Yeah. Um, was, did you? Was that translated into other languages as well? Uh, it's been translated uh, a few times. It's been translated into Dutch at the moment. Um, it was translated into Arabic um, uh, by a very, uh, I, I understand, very good Arabic translator, um, which I was pleased happened. That was a, it was kind of translation as um, uh, as a as a as a sort of form of transmission in you know in the uh, in the in a in a global world it, it, it felt uh, that it had a particular moment it was published um, during the first kind of protests in Tahrir Square and my um, the guy who translated was translated it was obviously interested as an Egyptian guy in it as a thing about colonialism and about um, violence and historical yeah. rupture so it seemed like um, if you haven't read it, the broken word is about the um, Kenyan Mau Mau uprising. Yeah, so that was that was. Um, I mean, I th you know, I don't know that uh, it was read very much or what kind of life it had after mm -hmm. translation, but um, it felt kind of apropos to him and, and to me that it should be it should happen at yeah. that time. And was did you get different kinds of questions from your translators in when you were having poetry translated? Uh, not or? particularly, no. Um, I mean, I've actually really had very few questions from the people who have translated my uh, stuff. I would I quite, I expected there to be more, and was quite in, interested in what kind of conversations might come up. But they're very much like sort of copy editing questions that you get from an yeah. English uh, copy editor. Um, they put you on your metal, you know, because they actually even uh, they are they are very. Um, they're obviously very engaged with the text in a very profound way. They want to know what your thought was, what you mean, mm -hmm. um, which is is different in emphasis to how uh, other editing uh, happens. And they, and you have to uh, you have to know, <laughs> um, which uh, you, you don't necessarily always, but generally you're kind of you you do. It turns out remember precisely what you thought you meant when you wrote um, that you know one in several hundred thousand sentences. Or, yeah. Um, Antonio, I was interested in, in terms of the, the, the poetry thing, because what, how did the translators of Possession handle that? Because obviously you wrote quite a lot of poetry for that in the style of Victorian poets, Browning and Tennyson, but when it seems to, it sort of sends out immediate signals to any English reader who's read those poets, but obviously is a very different 
thing for them to translate? I, I, I thought this was going to be a huge difficulty. And in fact, I do seem to have a, a group of extraordinarily good translators in many languages, and most of them rose to the occasion. I, um, the, in Swedish, it was done by a sort of Swedish poet. He did them and he didn't do the prose, but I went to a reading he gave of my poems and it sounded absolutely wonderful that I don't understand any Swedish. Um, um, and I think the best moment was when um, I opened an envelope and a lot of little German lyrics fell out and I read them and they were beautiful and I thought, I, I sort of said to my husband, this is by Heine. It wasn't. It was Melanie Waltz having translated my lyrics into this impeccable German, which I think mm. was possibly better than what I had written. And the French translator I've been talking about couldn't quite get the scanning. He could get the meaning, but his French scanning wasn't quite good enough. And the Scandinavian ones endlessly argue with each other about <laughs> um, how to translate natural history. They say these flowers are not those flowers, they're these flowers. And you said that on page 239. You can't have meant that because on page 130 it said this. And then they argue with each other. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think this is sort of immensely healthy. It's reading and writing all going on, you know, at a very cheerful level. Yeah. Um, and you, you said in, the, in your dedication to the little black... Um, book of stories that you were dedicating it to your German translator and your Italian translator and you said um, talking to them over the years has changed my writing and my reading and I was curious how it's changed your reading um, well I have become European as opposed to English or American I think now they tell me things to read and they send me books so particularly the German one I couldn't have written the children's book without endless material she supplied me with about German puppetry at, in, at that period. Mm. And she makes, she makes the most incredibly complicated jokes, which... Are they funny? Oh, very, but you have to think and think and think about okay. them. This causes me <laughs> to think in German, and, um, and it caused me to have the courage, really, to read in German mm. a lot more than I would have thought I could, which I suppose how I came to be doing this. Um, but... They do discuss, my, these translators, they've been there for you know, 20 years or so, they, they do discuss ideas with you, and because they discuss it from a completely different point of view. I talk quite a lot to my Italian translator who, for instance, after the war, found a gun in her father's drawer, and she didn't know whether which side of the war he was on in Italy mm. and whether he was bluffing and pretending to be a good man when really he was a bad man or what was happening. But this story absolutely fascinated me. It sort of took me out of the world I was in. Mm. And I know her I know her now really very well and I love her very much. And there are two of them in fact. The other one is a man who never says anything and I, I love him too. <laughs> and, and, and they go up a mountain with their current translation of my book and each of them has done one page same page and then they decide between them which of the versions is better the thought of anybody doing that kind of conscientious work mm. on your work mm. is incredibly moving I, yes. I, 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 the thing is I, I can't read a lot of the languages now I, I can't read either simple Chinese characters or complex Chinese characters they come through the front door looking beautiful and you don't Quite know. often that your name on the copyright page is the only thing that's telling yes, you exactly, what it is. Yes, exactly, exactly. That, that's very disturbing. And the Korean version, I think it was a possession, came through the front door. And I said to my husband, they must have cut this to ribbons, it was so short. And um, <laughs> so I sort of looked at it. And then um, a bit later, I got into correspondence with a Korean, with whom I'm still corresponding. So I said, could you look at this and say, see if it's all there? And he wrote back and said, yes, it is all there, and moreover, it's a very good translation. So, Gosh, so it, it boils so it down must, it must sort of It must sort of condense itself yeah. somehow. <laughs> um, Adam, um, I think you've said that the, the truth about these strange times, which is your first novel, was um, partly inspired by your reading of War and Peace. Can you explain a bit more about that? Uh, yeah, I was... Um, uh, I was... Uh, Rereading War and Peace actually at the time, um, and it, uh, I was th uh, thinking about. I had as the start of a character, I guess, or there were certain thoughts that I, that I was kind of coming back to, and they interlocked a bit with 
the, with who Pierre Bezukhov is, um, particularly at the beginning of the novel, I noticed just how sort of uh, convenient it is that he comes into this enormous inheritance, um, these fantastic scenes of the deathbed of the uncle, and, uh, or in the antechambers of the deathbed of the uncle and stuff. Um, and it, it was a kind of uh, counterfactual, you know, what would Pierre's fate have been had he not been immensely wealthy, had he just been lumbering and awkward mm. and all the other things that he is, actually, and also not clever. You know, I, 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 I took his intelligence away from my, uh, my character for that for that mm. novel. So it was, um, yeah, very directly, it was out of thoughts that had, had been started by reading that. Yeah. Uh, well, I have roughly a million more questions that I could ask, but I, rather than do that, I'm going to open it out to you. And if you um, could ask your questions, preferably in English, um, and also <laughs> wait until the roving mic arrives, um, that would be great. And I can't actually see enough to point. Oh, actually, maybe I can. Oh, that's okay. better. There you are. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I've been listening with great interest. Um, I'm German, and I read a lot in German and in English. <clears throat> and it always strikes me that on the English book market there are far fewer translations from other languages and actually the amount of published books in translation uh, into English is very small, unlike the German book market. Why do you think that is? I think it's partly, I mean you will answer better, but it's partly simply financial. There are so many too many books written in English already for publishers to choose from, good books. I mean, there are just too many books. And then to have to pay a translator on top of that and to be able to read the book, I think it's partly just difficulty and we need people like you sort of <laughs> nevertheless holding out. Um, I think there's, um, there's another answer also, or a further answer, um, which has to do with you know, people, want, people read to travel to have other... Uh, kinds of experience, access to other kinds of experience. Actually, within the English language world, there's a great variety uh, of experience and variety of voices, whether it's coming from the Indian subcontinent or Australia or, you know, uh, southern Gothic in America. There's tremendous variegation within Engl l fiction that is written in the English language in, in the first place, which, there, you know, if you're uh, Latvian, there isn't so much variation within Latvian. You know, you need to translate to, to see the world. Um, it's obviously a great shame that there isn't, there isn't more, um, uh, but I think that does explain to some extent why there isn't the pressure for, to bring books into uh, the English language that there is into other languages. What do you, would you think that? I, mean, I think it's partly to do with the, um, the f one of the kind of advantages of, of how global the world is now, that people have um, had you know, these experiences themselves, they're not necessarily looking for them in books. And also just the, the Anglo-centricity of our, um, our culture means that we, we are very spoiled um, and that a lot of things, you know, are written or, you know, if you, if you think about the way that um, we're, our culture is quite dominated by things in English or American English. Um, and I was, I was speaking to someone the other day who was saying that they were, they were Icelandic and that quite often the things, the novels that they read from German or French have been translated via English. So I think because English ten is kind of such a dominant language in the, in the world, we, we sort of forget um, how much of the world is, is reliant on, on actually having things translated. But I, I feel reasonably sort of um, optimistic about our openness to works in, fo in a foreign language. And I think if they are presented right, then there's no barrier to that. And I think that things like, um, you know, The Bridge or um, these amazing Scandi crime series are really, I mean, that, that's, that's what's happening. That's interesting. It doesn't matter whether it's, it's you know, got subtitles or, or, or translated. But I think it's about 3% on average of the, the works in English, are, the works in, available in the UK are, are from translations. There's a problem with French as well, because that's the language I can, you know, read most happily. But people, French people writing novels haven't been very interested in storytelling for a long time. And if you talk to a French person about a book, they simply discuss the beauty of each sentence, one after the other. 
And I read a wonderful French book about some Chinese people up a mountain hiding Balzac under the bed. And I keep saying to French people, you know, this is the best French book I've ever Oh, his sentences are so ugly. <laughs> it's a beautiful book. And I mean, my French isn't that bad. They don't seem to me to be peculiarly ugly, but they have such a pronounced sense of style that A, they don't go into English, and B, English doesn't go into them. It's very well, difficult. I think that isn't true of the Germans. I always find that when I'm, I'm being pitched books at the Frankfurt Book Fair by French um, rights directors or, or editors, that they will talk for five minutes and I have no idea where the book is set, what, what the story is at all, but I know it's very beautiful. Um, <laughs> so I think, was there a question? Okay. Thank you. Um, the sort of freer version translation that you did, Adam, was really striking. Um, but I, I'm really interested also in um, even faithful translations, uh, where you might take two translators, I think, um, Antonio, you mentioned it, two translators a attempting a faithful translation of a work. And you can still see huge variants when you look at them side by side because of word choices and the very, very complex set of choices um, that the translators might make, one word for another. Um, and I just wondered when you were attempting um, a any part of this process whether, whether you found yourself wrestling with, with those kind of choices about which word to use um, at that level. I think you do wrestle. And it will be your version. As I said, I know I have a, a preference for Germanic Anglo-Saxon derived words over Latin derived words and because of the nature of English there's quite often one of each or two of each that you could be using in any particular place both as a writer and as a translator but there's an extraordinary sensuous pleasure in deciding which the right one is as well as an intellectual pleasure and you know that if somebody else translated it they would make other choices um, and one of the things that I used to read, I can't remember the second man's name, but Stephen Spender translated Rilke's Do We Know Elegies with somebody whom I actually used to know. And they were very accurate translations, and I didn't like them. And I worked out after a bit that their preference was entirely for Latinate words. They were good translations, but there was no sort of overhang of German or Anglo-Saxon, which meant that they had done something to Rilke, who is very German, 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 that that hurts you if you actually read him. But that kind of thing happens as well. It's, it, it's just simply fascinating. And they were perfectly good translations. They just felt a bit wrong. I think there was a question. Oh, sorry, do you want to? No, I, well, I was just thinking, it's kind of, that question sort of starts to press on, I think, the what is kind of, might be acknowledged as kind of impossible about translation. Um, and you know, one acknowledges and moves on because that's, it's not necessarily it shouldn't be a kind of a halt to our thinking about it. But there's, you know, the um, and the, actually the impossibility of ever fully learning another language um, in terms of the kind of the accumulation um, of association from your kind of earliest infancy. You know, A is for apple, B is for ball, C is for cat. You know, those. These words from that moment acquire particular charge and particular connections, um, and that I, is that. I, I wonder if that's something that is never fully available to uh, people who are working from a second language into a, a first language. Whether that's, that's a kind of ultimately knowable. I mean, so I think what I, I suppose what I'm saying is that I want there's 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 possibly a known unknown <laughs> in translation, which is which is that quality. Well, there's. You know the line in Antony and Cleopatra, the bright day is done and we are for the dark, which is just, it's kind of you know it's absolute sort of plain English, and yet to sound sort of a bit a bit kind of sub Ted Hughes about it, it's sort of plugged into absolutely the kind of the national grid of kind of association and and resonance in the in the English language, and it and it and it has a feel and a and a kind of and a particular quality. Um, that, that may not be recoverable in translation. I, I need to say quickly, um, I think the title of my next novel is We Are For The Dark. Right. Oh. 
but I also have had the thought that it's untranslatable. Right. You know, I start thinking of my translators, and I don't know if they could do anything with it that yeah. would have any resonance in any other language. Mm. Well, Sh um, Peter Stamm's new novel is um, from a line in of a Shakespeare sonnet, um, which I think it's um, Alice Nacht, um, Alice da um, Targis Nacht in, in German, but in English with it's all days are nights, which obviously we've gone back to Shakespeare rather than try to, to render that different, differently. Um, and Javier Marius did um, A Heart So White, didn't he? Um, as, as his... I mean, how did that, was that in... It was translated into Spanish. Mm. Tan Blanco. Um, Corazon Tan Blanco. Um, mm. No, I, I think... I mean, in a sense, it doesn't matter. I think Adam yeah. Thurwell, who isn't here, holds the belief that there is no primary text of anything. And he would no doubt argue, if he was here, that we all read a different book when we read each other's books anyway. No two people... When I used to teach literature in evening classes, I used to try and say it doesn't matter if you skip because nobody has read every word of any book. And each time I reread a book, I miss out certain other words. Um, so... In a sense, it is an imperfect thing, but I don't think, nevertheless, I agree with Adam Thirlwell. I, I think one should be aiming at, at the text, or yeah. a text that has been as much perfected as it can be. Mm. Now we've got three. Okay, sorry. Um, I think this is, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you um, about this act of translation. If you're writing, and um, especially A.S. Byatt had said, uh, the importance that you place on language and the precision of language and so on. So if your work is then translated, not just yours but anybody's, is the, is the sentence structure, the voice that you have, the whole feel of it, can that be replicated in another language? Are you, and if you're able to read your translated work, are you happy that it is how you wished it to sound to, or, to, or to read to the reader? It varies a lot. Um, as I said, I was absolutely staggered by these German poems that came to me in an, in an envelope. My German translator, I'm interested to know what Adam thinks, my German translator believes very strongly that you should never break a sentence up, that you should translate a sentence by a sentence which replicates that sentence. I mean, I don't, I think, when I do do bits, I don't do that because some of it gets so clumsy you can't do it. But she believes that very strongly. So her and other Germans have translated my books and I can recognize her sentences, hers or mine or the sentences. Um, I was thinking, I have read some perfect translations, which I'd like just briefly to mention. George Steiner wrote a wonderful book on translation and he quotes a French translation of Gerald Manley Hopkins's The Wreck of the Deutschland and it is word for word it, you couldn't, it's the same poem and the rhythms are the same and you wouldn't have thought, I mean that poem above all anybody could do it but it was done uh, it makes you sort of laugh aloud for pleasure that anyone could do that have you read that? I haven't. It sounds extraordinary. It is quite... You, you wouldn't think that it could be that poem that anybody no. could possibly no. translate. And yet I think, you know, I think the very difficult things are quite challenging to translators. Yeah. It's like James Joyce. Yeah. I think one thing that this um, anthology, this, this, uh, this kind of massive international parlor game has uh, put into question is, is the idea of style and um, how... Uh, how translatable style is and what style consists of. Um, and I'm, it's a question I'm still unsure about. But I, I, I have in mind one of Schopenhauer's aphorisms is that a writer's style is the physiognomy of his mind, so, which is a very, you know, it's, it's absolutely the expression of the particular uh, configuration of an individual mind. Um, and I guess that doesn't that wouldn't necessarily interrupt uh, translation, or you know it would it would give you hope for the translation of style in uh, if all translation is passing in and out of kind of the writer no, versions of the writer's thought and write the writer's intent um, into and carrying them into a new version. Um, but obviously, you know, a lot of the time when we're reading in translation, we're reading we are reading 
versions of a star which are uh, are kind of sufficient to themselves and and and, and wonderful and and not necessarily uh, precisely replicating the originals. Uh, I have in mind, you know, the Scott Moncrief, Terence Kilmartin, Proust translations, which are wonderful, um, but not you know the more accurate, uh, more faithful translations can be made, but they are you know as a uh, they are completely kind of uh, work on their own terms but and he, cons- he, with consistency. He inserted so many unnecessary words. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't read him till I was teaching Proust again in an evening class, so I had to look at the English, which I hadn't done because I had made myself read the whole of Proust. In, and, and every sentence in Scotland Creeps, there's an unnecessary word that Proust didn't write. Mm. Uh, um, Proust is sparser and yeah, clearer yeah, yeah. and more. Much more and sort of maintained, much more essayistic. Yeah. yeah. Maybe shorter. That would help. <laughs> <laughs> That's a beautiful thought. <laughs> so, another, I think it was. Thank you very much. Um, well, possibly uh, just two comments. Uh, one is um, I was often thinking what a huge responsibility it is to be the translator of sort of major work of literature. Um, I also come from Germany, and I remember reading Pasternak in German. It was a very hurried translation by a Lithuanian, and it was really bad. And I thought, what is this fuss about Pasternak and Dr. Shivago? Then I came to England, and I, I bought the English translation. I thought, what a fantastic piece of writing this was. So I was thinking, well, Pasternak is finished for the entire German literature scene until he was retranslated. Um, and just one other thing about the original story you were talking about. Um, and you were saying, well, this this story about the dismembered body in, in a bedroom, 1920s. And I immediately thought, well, it was very much a 1920s um, subject called Lust Murder and painted by George Goss and I um, can't think of the Dresden painter, um, and much written about. And indeed, it, it appeared in all the journals. So you were probably right, I think, in that sense. And early Hitchcock, I guess, is something of the, uh, the atmosphere of the lodger about uh, this story, too. Yes, it is. Mm. But I hadn't thought of connecting George Gross to it. And of course, he does connect. Except that he was a great artist, and this person isn't. Yeah. Only he's not on this showing. Well, let us be, let us be fair to him. <laughs> do you think you improved him, or do you think he, he was imp- made more interesting in the act of translations? Um, I think one. I mean, I agree with my dead French translator. One shouldn't try and improve things; one should render them. But um, and one should. Try, I would always try. That's another great. Um, bone of contention. I would try and use a vocabulary that belonged to the period of what I was translating. Um, And I can try to remember. Oh, I know who it was, yes. It it was Gabriel Josipovich's mother who was translating something. And she believed with equal passion that it should be brought into modern English and not Victorian English. And I said, no, you can't use a vocabulary it wasn't in. She said, I am translating it now. And these are two perfectly tenable mm. points of view. I think we've probably got time for one more question, and there's someone who's been very patiently waiting there. Um, I'm, I'm French, but I'm not going to react to what you said about <laughs> French books, etc. Les belles phrases. My question was more, um, it, it's maybe slightly controversial but or provocative, but could we think of the translator in the same way we think of the actor or the director? Because you talked about the importance of the reader and first and foremost, the translator is a reader who is giving you his or her reading of the book he or she is translating. So obviously you want to be as faithful as possible, but in the end you are interpreting a text for people who without you wouldn't be able to read it. In the same way that a director or an actor is interpreting a text. And also, Antonia, you said translating is a secondary art. Would you also say that the actor or the director are, you know, 
secondary artists in the same way? Um, yes, I would. Um, they don't think they are. Um, but, but they are secondary. If you, if you think of Shakespeare, um, it is secondary to disrupt his rhythms for your own purposes. I had a friend who is a writer who was commissioned, she was commissioned by a theatre company of a slightly experimental kind to write um, a play around a fairy story and she wrote an absolutely beautiful play and then they were so creative with it, the actors and the director, that nothing was left of what she had written and she couldn't bring herself to go to it. And there is that tendency in the theatrical profession not to interpret but to to do um, and, and wonderful things happen but, but, but I like Shakespeare better than any actor or director um, I, I want him leaving a, well you can't leave him alone if you're going to put him on stage but um, and just one final question from me if, if, if I may uh, what would be your desert island translation Adam uh, um, crumbs can, I, can you give me a can you ambush Antonio with that? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and give me a moment. Desert Island translation. Um, I don't think this is really the answer if I had three quarters of an hour to think it, but I would say Constance Garnett's Dostoevsky, just because I think she was actually doing Dostoevsky and not doing things to him. Yeah, I'd be, um, I'd be happy with that. Um, choice. I mean, but there are there are also. Um, a choice. Sure, different I, islands. Well, no, I was thinking in particular of um, Dostoevsky earlier of the of the of the, pe the peculiar and particular quality of those um, translations, um, uh, which have such a, 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 a freaky uh, vibrancy to them. Um, but I mean, I think there's there's lots of very good translation being done at the moment. Um, and very interesting and kind of significant things are coming into um, uh, English, and there, you know there've been, uh, uh, been you know from whether it's uh, you know Stephen Mitchell's um, Rilke, mm -hmm. or there've been kind of big figure translators as well who um, uh, you know who are who are having a really kind of important um, effect on on British and uh, English language literary culture. So actually, if I'm going to make a Desert Island choice, it's one I haven't read yet, but I'm very excited to get my hands on, uh, which is Leopardi Zibaldone, which has just been done into English, the so two and a half thousand pages of uh, Giacomo Leopardi's uh, notebooks, which are apparently astonishingly uh, rich and exciting. Thank you. So all that remains... Oh, it's uh, it's two names that I was unfamiliar with actually, but uh, uh, not for much longer, hopefully. So all that re remains for me to say is vielen Danke to Antonia, <laughs> Toda to Adam, and mil, mil grazie, um, muchas gracias, and thank you to all of you for being here today. Thank you. Yes, I, I would just like to echo those thanks. I didn't want to say at the beginning because I didn't want to tempt fate, but actually um, Antonia has rather struggled to get here because she's a little bit under the weather, but none of us would, none of you would ever have guessed that, I'm sure. So I'm particularly appreciative and also particularly appreciative of Laura and for Adam having to sort of wait to see how to you know, how this trio was going to configure and whether or not um, Antonia was going to be able to be part of it. Um, so thank you all very much. And also, finally, I'd like to say thank you so much for choosing as your Desert Island um, translation, Constant Garnet's um, Dostoevsky, which has very close associations with uh, Charleston because Constant Garnet's son, David Garnet, um, was one of the original inhabitants of Charleston. Charleston Charleston was created as a refuge for pacifists in the First World War. Um, David Garnett was a pacifist and therefore worked on the land and the, his a group of friends uh, uh, found Charleston as a base for pacifists um, during the First World War. So that connects with 
Constant Garnet, and with Dostoevsky. Uh, thank you all very much. I'm going, after a final round of thanks, I'm going to ask you all to remain seated while we take Antonia, Adam, and Laura off the stage um, to the back of the uh, uh, books, to the bookstall at the back, where you can look at copies of Threshold. It's a very rewarding, very entertaining, very stimulating book, um, as well as um, I'm sure they've got other books of their um, individual work, not their translations. Thank you very much.